everyone, welcome to Two Car Pros, and today we are officially continuing our how to build a big block Chevrolet. Today we're going to be putting on the starter, uh, motor mount, bolts, thermostat, uh, torque converter shield, uh, and a couple other little things. And we're also, oh, we're also going to show you how to set your gap on a points ignition, a little bit old school fun stuff there. I also go over why this. Uh, Big Block's been a little bit uh, inconsistent with uploading, just because getting a Big Block Chevy inside of a GMF body is actually pretty tricky, and there's a couple little custom things we have to do to get it to work. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in. So before we get started, I wanna show what's kind of holding the Big Block up. And it's right here. Just getting this header on is pretty difficult. I know it doesn't really look like much, especially on camera, but I've tried three different sets of headers. None of them fit. I've tried bashing them. I've tried cutting pipes out. I've tried pretty much everything. The Holly says that they want to raise the engine by installing something to get the engine a little bit higher, but I really don't want to do that. And I've been talking to a lot of really cool Camaro guys that um, say that these headers here work. So I'm hoping I can get a set of these bad boys in and then we can actually hear it run. So that if you're wondering why the Big Block series has been, you know, kind of on a hiatus, this would be why. So this is the starter we've selected. It's a Made in USA product made by Powermaster Performance. Um, this is a pretty cool starter because it's a gear reduction starter. It's a lot smaller than the old school starters. The old school starters were bigger than the box it comes in, so and a lot heavier. So you want to opt for a really nice quality starter. Link down below in the description. It's the exact one we're using. And I'll show you exactly why it's cool. So we can open it up, has a bunch of warnings on there, and it says made in the United States, very cool, and a tech support line in case you get in trouble. I've already taken this out of the box, so the bolts are a little uh, not in their packaging. So you can remove this. This is insanely light, it's very good quality, and what makes this starter really neat is this. So you can remove these bolts and orientate the starter exactly how you want it to be, which is mind-blowing to someone like me that's used to starters that only go in the one way. I've already done a test fit with this and it turns out the stock orientation is the perfect orientation for me. So a little bit of irony there, but it is a very nice piece. So I'm gonna go over the back of this while it's outside of the car. This little teeny tiny bolt here, that's the trigger from the ignition. So when you hit the key, this is what activates that. Now, where it gets power is this bolt right here, or this nut and stud, that is going to come from the 12 volt positive of your battery and it's actually going to be the whole junction power for the entire car right there uh, for this situation and more modern cars that's not really the case but this is old school and that's why we're going to do it so the bolt box uh, says right here don't discard additional shimming for perfect fit may be required and they're right uh, nine times out of ten you can pretty much get away without using the shim but you can get a couple shims here. Now, if you get like a really mechanical sound, it's like really gross and screechy and grinding and terrible. Um, basically, it doesn't sound like a starter. It sounds like a disaster. You're gonna wanna put these shims in, uh, one or two of them, depending on how drastic the noise is. And what that's gonna do is move the Bendix slightly further away from the center of the uh, flywheel or flex plate. So depending on your situation, how big your flex plate or flywheel is, you'll be using one set of uh, bolt holes here. You have two sets of bolt holes uh, depending on how big around your flex plate or flywheel is and if you have to use this outer one that's why this little bolt was included with our kit but I already test fitted this bad boy and we're going to be using both of these long guys here. Alright so now that we uh, have our starter with a bolt already in the mount here you can put that up and then always do a test fit of your starter before you put it in especially in this situation where you can clock it differently. And then I did put some washers on here too that weren't included just because I thought the, head, the heads of these little app, or these ballon bolts weren't as big as I'd like. So just got some washers on there I had laying around. So my suggestion is when you're first putting a starter on, uh, not to use the shim. Uh, only put the shim on if you run into a problem. So they're pretty easy to put on and uh, I'm, that's the way I recommend doing it. So we're gonna tighten this evenly side to side using our 5 16 Allen. Uh, you might just have regular bolts though. 
So. And for a torque spec today, I would recommend something like 35 foot-pounds, but uh, I'm not using a torque wrench here, just arm tight is good. So we're at the Bendix side of the starter here, that's what this gear is called, and this Bendix has a solenoid that gets kicked out, and that interacts with your flywheel or flex plate ring gear here. And then once the engine starts, the engine spins much faster than the starter can, along with the starter turning off, the Bendix is then retracted. There's actually a solid gap here. So here's a better shot of the Bendix ring gear gap. Check that out. There's actually a solid uh, bit of space there. So that comes out, uh, that kicks out quite a bit. So if you don't have a gap like this or they're touching, you got something wrong. Either you got the wrong starter, you have the wrong flex plate or flywheel. Something is incorrect, something's too big. The next thing we can do is bolt on a torque converter shield. This is gonna vary on what transmission you have. So this particular part number I have, it's a Summit Racing G3883B, link down below in the description, will fit a Turbo 400, Turbo 350, and our transmission, a 700R4. Let me take this out. They make these in a bunch of different materials. You can get them made out of built aluminum, you can get them chromed, you can get them whatever. I thought black painted stamps sheet metal would be more than fine. It doesn't need to be that flashy for me. And if you're worried about your torque converter, our transmission getting uh, too warm there, it does have a vent in the bottom to vent out excess heat. So we're gonna go ahead and put our flywheel slash torque converter dust cover here up into its home. Different transmissions are gonna require different bolts because they're all just a little bit different. Uh, like these are metric bolts, they're 10 millimeter, but they go into my metric transmission. If you had an American transmission, you're gonna use American bolts and that depends on what transmission you're using. <laughs> and snug these bad boys up wrist tight in a cross pattern as possible. And there we go, transmission shield installed. So the next thing we're gonna work on is putting the motor mount bolts in. Now, uh, this is a little interesting because I couldn't really find exactly what nuts and bolts to use here But online I found this and this is made by OER. The link is down below in the description It is a part number 14344 steering box slash motor mount bolt um, So you're gonna need two of these bad boys Two. I like using washers too I know some people don't but I'm got these uh, 7 16 washers, gonna put those on both sides of our application here. And the nut is a 7 16 by 14, just like that. I bought a whole box of them, cause why not? And you're basically going to build it just like this with the motor mount in the middle there and the meat. So. so we're over here on our driver's side motor mount. I'm gonna show you how to do one cause they're both exactly the same and the header's not installed on this side. So it's really easy to see. Go ahead and grab our bolt with our washer here and install that. Just like that. We can go ahead and grab our washer and put that on first. Very cool. And then the nut. Snug that up finger tight for right this moment. Just like that. All right, so we're gonna take an 11 16 open end wrench here, put it on the nut side, grab our 5 8 socket, and tighten the bolt head side. As far as torque spec goes, just snug. It's not actually holding anything left or right. It's all holding in vertically. So the bolt would have to shear upward in order for it to fail. It's not a real tightening issue. If you're looking, really looking for a torque spec, 30 pounds is probably where you're looking. Alrighty, this next step applies if you're using points and a condenser like we are, but if you're running an HEI, more modern distributor, they're pretty much plug and play with the uh, little box that comes with it. But we're going old school, so we gotta set our gap as far as our points go. So the first thing we need to do is remove our distributor cap. Fairly easy, standard screwdriver. Just pushing those down and turning to the left and lift straight off. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the rotor here with a Phillips head screwdriver, just so you can get a better view of what you're doing. And remove that bad boy. So what you're looking at now are the weights and springs in charge of your uh, ignition advance curve. So as this spins, the weights fly outward due to centrifugal force, just like this, and advance your timing a little bit there. There's two ways to change that. You can change the weights out to be heavier or lighter, or you can change your springs out to be um, firmer or softer. So now we can uh, go ahead and turn our engine over 
by hand using a breaker bar I've shown countless times. We're going to turn that over until that arm there is on the reluctor gear and the points are open. It doesn't take very much. Just like that. Now it's right on the money where we can do some adjustments. So our points here want to be 18 thousandths of an inch opening just there. And you need a really small set, really thin set of uh, feeler gauges. You want to be like 16 thousandths, 18 thousandths. I'll be 18 thousandths, so we can slip that in there. And there is just a little bit of play in there. So this is probably like 22 thousandths or so. And we can go ahead and adjust it using this adjustment screw here. And it uses an eighth inch Allen, so we can go ahead and tighten that up until it's just, oh, that's a little too much actually. You don't want to crush your feeler gauge either. So I have a little too much. There we go, it's just super snug in there to get that 18 thousandths feeler gauge. So now we know our points are perfect. So here's a pro tip for you. Get a little dab of grease on the end of your finger there and put it on the reluctor gear. That way, uh, as it goes around, you don't have wear, too much wear surface between the arm and the reluctor. Uh, just don't use too much. You don't want that grease flying off and getting everywhere. So I've swapped camera angles here. Um, can't really see the condenser way in the back there, but that needs to be tight. The condenser can't move, so that needs to be nice and firm. The wires need to not touch anything that rotates, make sure that there is plenty of gap there. And then our main star of the show here, that's actually incorrect. You can see here that this wire connector is actually touching ground. That is no good. See that right there? Not good. So this needs to be untightened and maneuvered in a way that there's um, a bit of gap there that can't touch. Now we can put our rotor back on. Now you can't actually put it on incorrectly due to there being a square and round hole. Um, so don't worry about 180ing it. Make sure that's snug, but you know, don't overdo it. There we go. Now we can put our distributor cap back on. It has a little tab in there to index it on a little groove on the body, just like that. And then we can grab our standard screwdriver, push those spring retainers back down. Oh, no, there we go. So the next thing we're going to focus on is getting our thermostat done. And what I have here is our thermostat housing. This is just a regular uh, GM product. So I've left the link down below in the description to our thermostat housing here. The gasket is made by Felpro, link down below. This came actually in our big engine building kit. I will leave a link down below in the description to this one by itself. And then I want to talk about our main star of the show here. This is a 160 degree thermostat made by General Motors. Look at that, very cool. Now, I wanted to talk about that these come in all kinds of different degrees. So this is made in the United States. They make a bunch of different ones in varying temperature ranges. I picked um, 160, I thought that'd be the best for application here. And I know there's a lot of people out there that um, think that if you don't run a thermostat that your big block will run cooler. And it's actually not true because in addition to this getting your heater to warm up quicker on a cold day or something, this also regulates flow through your coolant system. And what that means is that if this is flowing too much, too much flow is going through your engine, not enough. There isn't enough time for the coolant to sit in the radiator and become cool. So you just have a really large saturation limit on that coolant. So this will regulate that flow and actually cause your coolant temperature to go down uh, despite this being uh, an apparent obstruction. The next thing we're gonna do is take our old friend carburetor spray, link down below in the description, spray it on a nice terry towel, and then clean that mating surface real well. We don't want any grease or oil or any obstruction preventing us from making a seal. There we go, it's nice and clean. So again, we're gonna take our terry towel and some carburetor spray. We're gonna clean that mating surface. Actually, we're gonna clean the whole thing on this flange here, this flange surface side. Don't want any grease or manufacturer or anything on there. So that's nice and clean. Check that out, very cool. And then what we're gonna do is grab, well, let's go ahead and test fit it to make sure we got it right. That looks pretty good. Just to double check it. And what we're gonna do is grab some spray adhesive, link down below in the description. And we're just gonna apply a nice coat to our gasket here. Yeah. Apply it to our housing, just like that. <laughs> 
Go all the way around, lift it back up, place it back down, and work fast because the glue is setting. And you just want it to be nice and centered and not obstructed at all. It should look just like that. Now we can go over to the car. All right, we're gonna go ahead and put our thermostat down in there and uh, make sure you don't put it in upside down. Make sure you put it in right side up because our sensor here needs to go into the hottest water. Just like that. So what we're gonna do is take a little bit of our old friend silicone rubber or RTV, whatever you want to refer to it as. And we're just gonna spread that around this opening here. You don't need to do the bolt holes, just this opening. And you want it nice and thin, don't go crazy. And we're just making a good seal here. We're not trying to take up a giant gap like on an intake manifold or something for an oil valley. There we go, just like that. Now we can go ahead and drop our thermostat housing on there. And you wanna to try to drop it on straight on as possible. You don't want it to moosh around too much. You might notice I got some lock washers on there. That is the technical right way to do it. So as far as tightening goes, we're gonna grab a 916 socket. We're gonna do as evenly as we can left to right here. Uh, I also wanna go over how much to tighten them. Now, this is an aluminum intake, so it's a little bit uh, weaker than, you know, just like a cast iron one. So the torque spec's gonna be lower. So I wouldn't go up any more than 15 maybe, but honestly, just snug with your best judgment is probably gonna be good. Good enough. And then if there's any kind of excess sealant around the housing, go ahead and give that a nice wipe down there. So that wraps up this video. It's another awesome big block fun thing. I'm unsure when the next one will be done. I've gotten one header on on the passenger side and none for the driver's side. So I really have to figure out what I'm gonna do as far as headers go. And then we can put the carburetor on. Uh, do the firing order and then we're basically ready to fire so that's really exciting hopefully the next one we can hear it run at least a little bit but I kind of want to do like a hear it run and timing video all by itself but uh, we'll see how it goes thank you so much for watching make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any big block content and 5.3 uh, content coming very soon thanks again and we'll see you next time